What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Purposeful Marketing Podcast. Um, Lucia and Aaron are out today, so it's just Mary and I. Um, and yeah, we've um, we're kind of in. I've I've started thinking about this show in seasons, and we're I've been telling people we're in season three right now. Um, season one was how do we start thinking more about the principles behind what we're doing and how do we build a background of deep understanding about why we want to do the things that we want to do and why we feel X or Y way about marketing. Season two was about, okay, how do we like now take those first principles and talk about attribution? Um, and then season three has been a lot of like, let's bring on tactical experts and have them deconstruct what they do. Um, this episode is a standalone. This is our, by the time it publishes, it'll probably be the end of the year. Mary and I are on our last leg. Um, and we're going to do a one thing exercise. And for those unfamiliar with the one thing, it is where you say, you know, one thing that someone needs to do more of. Um, or one thing that you hope someone continues to do and one thing that you hope they change. Um, and we are going to be talking about marketers. So, um, with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Mary for her one thing that marketers need to keep doing in 2024. Yeah. So my big thing, since we've talked to so many marketers on this podcast this year, which has been so fun, and I've been a guest on a few podcasts this year, which has also been amazing, all B2B marketers, all in different industries. So it could be finance, HR, SaaS, um, services. It's been so great to like hear all these different perspectives. And what I've noticed is marketers are really smart, like go figure. And they have really great ideas. And so I really hope that going into 2024, marketers continue to have great ideas because it seems like right now you're stuck in one of two boats. You're either a resource strapped marketer. So you have all these really great ideas, but you're not exactly sure how to execute on them. Maybe you don't have the resources in house or your skill set. You don't think your skill set is quite there to execute on them. Or on the other side, your KPIs don't match your ideas. So you're like in an old school SaaS organization or old school services where you're only measured on leads or like a really low quality KPI. So some of your ideas you're not allowed to execute on because it doesn't tie back to your KPIs. Um, so I think that you should keep having ideas. You should and keep having those ideas and then write them down. So like put them somewhere where you can go back and review what your ideas are because your ideas are really, really good and you're really smart. And I think that is one of like the really big takeaways that I loved from our season three of the Purposeful Marketing Podcast. Do you think that there's going to be a particular challenge for folks to like act to continue like, having ideas. It's not going to be hard for people to continue having ideas, but to continue ideating about how they perform their work. It, it, will there be a particular challenge to keep doing that in 2024? I think that KPIs are always going to be a challenge for marketers because marketers are usually not super business savvy, which is not like, you know, any knock on them. It's just usually not the background they came from. They probably came from an arts degree. So like you and I did and Aaron did or they came from maybe like a really tactical background. So they accept the KPIs they're given. So like I'm seeing a lot of like marketers should be tied to leads or pipeline or revenue. And I think that super narrow focus like that discourages creative ideating. What do you think? I think that, I don't know. I think, I think about it both both ways. And I think it depends on the person who's tasked with that. And it depends on maybe the organization. Cause there are, sometimes it's like, well, we have this KPI because we want you to behave in a specific way. Um, and sometimes it's like, it's like a true like KPI. They, they actually want to see that thing. It's like a true measurable 
They don't care how you get it. Um, just give it to them. And, and there are other times that it's like, well, we measure in this way because we want to dictate your behavior in a certain way. So like, if it's just a measurement, sometimes like the constraint is where the ideas can get very good. Um, you know, it just, it takes a better idea to market well with bad resources, you know? So like resources can be a really helpful constraint for ideating. And, um, and I think the same is theoretically true for um, KPIs. It's just, it gives you a tougher problem. It's going to take a, it's going to take a stronger idea. It's going to take a more creative idea. Um, so in, in a way I disagree, but I know that there are also instances, instances in which the sum total of the constraints doesn't leave any space. You know, you have this KPI and you don't have resources and you're, you're on this time crunch. It's like, at this point, I'm just trying to keep my job. <laughs> yes. um, so I guess my answer is yes and no. Um, yeah, I think where I was going with it is more like the, like the company who gives you a KPI, like we'll do pipeline as an example, because that seems to be a pretty generally accepted one. Mm -hmm. And they want to know the back end attribution of every marketing sourced opportunity. So the dollar value of all those opportunities. And I think that's where like the creative limitation really comes from. But I do, I love that you pointed out constraints can actually harness creativity better. Cause I think that's totally true too. Yeah. What's your, what's your one thing that should change that marketers should do differently? Okay, so before we started recording and James and I were um, kind of prepping for this, I said they should think more strategically, but I think I'm going to change it because James brought up a good point. I'm going to change it. They should be executing more strategically. So I see a lot of marketers doing tactics and doing a lot of things, a lot of activities. Um, and that doesn't always necessarily tie back to a strategic objective. And I think about strategy in a really well-defined way for me. I don't know if everybody would agree with this, but I think that strategy is the way that you get to a goal. So your goal is marketing is in charge of sourcing $5 million of pipeline next year. Let's just say that's the goal. The strategy is how are you going to get to that goal? And then you have KPIs. So those KPIs tie back and let you know the strategy is working. And then the strategy ideally would help you get to the goal. So I think the missing piece is marketers create a goal or are given a goal. And they have these KPIs because everyone talks about KPIs um, on LinkedIn and stuff like leads, pipeline, revenue, um, click-through rate, view rate, impressions, all that good stuff. But there's like the gap. Like they don't really know how they're going to get there. So they just start doing all these random activities, hoping it's going to result in the end goal, which is pipeline in this example. So I think that's where I see a huge, huge, huge opportunity. And I wish um, people would do more of next year or no, what, what were you saying? Do, do less of? The thing that people should change. Should change. Yeah. So that's what they should change is like, tie that missing piece, like stop doing activities for the sake of doing activities and make sure that there's a strategy or a way that you're thinking about getting to the goal. Yeah. I don't know if I can argue with that. I guess a, a similar version of the same follow-up question I had for you before is, um, what, what's going to make that hard? Like, like what, like what's going to make 2024 the wrong, like some people think that's the wrong this is the wrong year to start executing strategically. That can be a resolution for 2025. Like what's going to be in folks' way? Yeah, the thing that's going to get in folks' way is mindset. So just mindset um, across a company. And this is true in almost every industry I've been in um, <laughs> this year, which is, you know, three jobs in one year. So I have a pretty good perspective on this, <laughs> um, is... I'll give like a really specific example of like what I did at Matt My Customers. I've been very vocal about this on LinkedIn. So you can go back to my past posts and um, back check me if you want. But the way that um, I thought about the strategy 
was we were going to double down on the podcast. So the podcast was going to be our pillar. Every podcast would be a, either an article, a blog or blog case study or key website page. So no matter what, that's the purpose of the podcast interview. Then from there, that video, the full video would become, you know, five to seven video clips. And then from there, it might become a few organic social media posts for either the company page or one of our um, internal employees. So that was the strategy was just, I think that we can hit our pipeline goal just by maximizing this single content pillar. And the issue I ran into is explaining how that program was a standalone program. So you couldn't take any of the pieces of that program and try and attribute it to individual opportunities from inbound. So an inbound would come in and they might say podcast in the self-reported attribution, but the software attribution would say like organic social. And then the first conversion would be from like a random website page. So that was the really difficult part for me. I don't know if maybe some people are just better at explaining it to um, leadership than I was, but it was hard for me to say, okay, this worked, this program worked because it's a holistic program. We cannot take any single piece and say it worked because of the five to seven social media clips. Cause that wouldn't have happened if I didn't create a key website page and the podcast in its original form. So I think that's, really what's standing in the way. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm not just good. Maybe I'm just not good at explaining it or, you know, people it's a, that's a difficult thing for people to wrap their mind around. Yeah. I, I guess I can, I can see exactly what you're saying because I can see a scenario where, you know, maybe someone knows that they're executing a tactic that doesn't entirely like that. There would be a more strategic way for them to spend their time, but part of this tactic being very standalone and like isolated from the rest of the activities that they do makes it really easily attributable. Like, so maybe it actually is performing really well at giving you at meeting some sort of goal. Um, but it's not contributing to it's maybe it's not helping you meet a KPI or it's helping you meet a KPI, but it's not helping you meet a goal or, um, it's a lot of, extra effort. It's not part of your strategic waterfall that's efficient, um, but it is easy to attribute. Um, and I can see where that becomes a problem because again, it's like a mindset of the entire company thing. It's like a, how, how do we want to think about measure, perform marketing dictates whether or not we do this thing that is just a tactic that has become separated from strategy over the last five years. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really great way to put it. Um, All right. So what are, what are yours, James? Time to move um, on. Yeah. I've actually, I've actually also kind of amended mine <laughs> from when we, from when we talked before, I think the thing that marketers should keep doing is in 2024, is they should keep tinkering with artificial intelligence. Oh, uh, I like it. With the caveat that like they should, you should do this, these kinds of things thoughtfully and they shouldn't just be replacing the hard stuff. You know, I think that, and I think some folks that, that are really good at using the tool seem to be using it not to replace the hard stuff. It's like, folks that say, I struggle with the blank page and the blinking cursor. So I have chat GPT start all of my content. It's like, no, that is not the answer. The answer is using it to in increase your, the good things, like the things that come easy to you. Um, those are the things that like, don't need a human. <laughs> like this is hard. Like, it's really easy for the AI to do the hard thing, the easy way. Like, and it's not, it's not powerful or impactful. It, it hurts you, but there are folks that are, that have, that are thinking about it the right way and using it, not as a, 
an intern that does the stuff <laughs> that they do, but as like uh, like gasoline on the the work that they're good at. Um, so yeah, I saw some I, I saw some really cool use cases for ChatGPT and marketing. Um, one person who's using it really successfully is doing it to like write code. So to like update their website pages or like add unique features that wouldn't be possible with just like a page builder or like your standard WordPress site. So I thought that was pretty cool. Cause like, like you said, they're not using it to like write the copy on their website. They're doing it to like enhance the design or to make it easier. Yeah. I love, I have the, my actual favorite thing about the LLMs. I don't think that the language models are the cool part about <laughs> I just don't, I can't believe it's like that what has contextualized all of our conversations about AI in 2023. And I know that by the end of 2024, we'll be talking about an entirely different set of capabilities that have nothing to do with language modeling, because it's the least interesting thing that this stuff could do for us. Um, but it is awesome for me when I'm in the back end of WordPress and just need to tinker with something, or I am just feeling OCD about the way something is displaying, or I like, that is how I learn that in the moment, how to code something because Google is not helpful um, with, with questions about code because there's too many languages. Um, it doesn't know how to react when I tell it what platform I'm working in and what you know, what version of WordPress or so on and so forth, like it's not responsive enough. So it's almost like talking to a dumber version of my developer that I just don't have to bother the developer at Gorilla with every little thing because a much simpler, dumber version is just available 24 seven for me to ask questions. Um, and I don't need to get on Slack. I can stay right in Google. Um, it's amazing. So I agree that like stuff, like when it comes to code or it's like, there are elements of your work that you're good at that you don't necessarily understand physically. Like I don't, I, I consider myself good at creating web content, but I don't like, I don't even have a hundred percent of a grasp on what web content actually physically web content physically is like, I don't understand the hard code on a website. I can't read it. Um, but now I can do a lot of things that I couldn't have done previously. I've enhanced my own skill set by basically making this thing teach me um, how to do that. Um, yeah, I agree. Another interesting one, I'm curious if you use it for this at all. I hear a lot of people using it as their search engine. Oh, yeah. I mean, that for me is like, that's what it's for. Yes. Because um, there's like so much garbage. Like, James, I know you're going to relate to this. Like, I am so freaking sick of looking up something like, show me the best project management software. And it's a freaking oh, yeah. organic. Oh, yeah. I'm so sick of looking up the best project. How many times do you think I've ever Googled project management software? <laughs> I know. But I think you'll relate to like just the general concept of this. So, of course... The top three organic results are project management software companies who are like, here's the top five. And oh, somehow like ours is number one. That's so crazy. Like, I'm just so sick of it. Like, that's what I love ChatGPT for is like an actual unbiased search engine. Yeah. I mean, I would question calling it unbiased, but because I don't know enough to know, like, you know, it's, 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 it could be biased by any number of things that aren't, um, nefarious, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that looking things up on Google is really painful sometimes. And, um, it's just not painful with chat GPT. And if, if I have messed up and this is something I should have gone to Google for, it's pretty obvious right away. And I don't have to sink too much time into it. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to take this to Google because I, I kind of know what I'm going to get there. Um, yeah, I, it's really, I don't really use ChatGPT to help me create content. It's oh, me like, either. 
and it makes my content worse um, at this point um, because I'm not tasked with producing volume. Um, so I'm tasked with impact. So, but I do use it for stuff like code questions, just random Google because Google's painful. And um, yeah, you don't have to scroll past ads. Um, it's nice. Yeah, I like that. All right, so what do you think marketers should change going into 2024? Yeah, this is something I feel more passionately about even than, than the AI for sure. Um, marketers should stop, stop organizing their thought in takeaways and insights and learnings. Like this is a very, that is such a rudimentary way of thinking that is like, that is how dogs think. Um, and if you, if there's only so much time you have in the day, and that, I know that that's why people try and think in takeaways and insights, and they think it's making them faster, that they're getting something quicker. Um, but over the course of time, um, you give yourself way, way, way less opportunities for real meaningful shifts in how you think about something. So like if I am talking to, if I get the opportunity, which this type of thing rarely happens to you if you are in industrial where there aren't a lot of customers, there aren't. If I get the opportunity to talk to a closed loss prospect and ask them questions and the thing that comes out of that 30 minute call is here are my three takeaways or my four or just any list of takeaways that you have so colossal colossally shit the bed like this needs to be something that you need to you need to think about it like be a thinking person who says has this validated any of the ways that i feel about my product or this client or what has what is validated by this conversation what do i feel more strongly what do I feel less strongly? What um, is do is anything here making me ring alarm bells about any of the work that we're doing, and why? Um, you know, just like think about it, talk to someone about it. You know, if there's anything super interesting in this call, find someone to talk to about it. Make it a part of the way that you think about your work. Because a list of takeaways is going to last you 25 minutes. There's no, it's like I could ship a bunch of ads, right? And I could run a bunch of A-B tests for um, does my audience prefer video or text content? Something like that. And I could set up an A-B test that theoretically conclusively tells me, you know, the exact same thing in a video versus text. The audience prefer video by X percent if we look at consumption rate or click through rate, pick something. And am I gonna, what am I really gonna do? I'm still gonna deliver balanced content of multiple mediums to my audience. This wasn't helpful. So like, it, it, like arranging the way you think and change the way you act through takeaways leads you to a bunch of very minute, borderline meaningless, quote unquote discoveries and no real mindset change, um, no real um, deep thought or deep understanding that can actually differentiate you from another person doing your job. Um, and there's nothing about deep thought that can't be systematized. It's like when you have that conversation with someone else, record it, put a transcript somewhere. You know, it's not like the only thing that you can ever institutionalize in your organization is takeaways and insights and reports. Um, you know, find a way to engage people in actual thought and you're, you'll be providing a lot more value because you'll be allowed to, or you'll be allowing yourself to do something actually different. Your ideas will be better. Um, you'll be able to ideate more. Um, I think it's the most frustrating thing that I see with folks is 
because we have so much to do and we don't have a lot of time, you know, we pinch frameworks from folks and we arrange our thinking in takeaways and insights. And it's like, man, we had, we are making ourselves dumb for no reason. Um, what's the real payoff for, for dumbing ourselves down here? Um, so yeah, that's the thing that I think folks should change at me. If you're a big takeaways person. <laughs> no, I think but. that's so, that's, I think that's so interesting, James, because like now that I'm thinking about it, like the most value I got out of like a customer research, for example, at Gorilla 76 was like listening to the call that you guys, that the content team conducted and like really thinking about it. If you guys would have just like the call reports are amazing. So they, they are not takeaways. This is like a very thorough document. But if you would have just given me a list of five takeaways from the conversation, number one, I probably would not have actually absorbed it, right? Because I'm just reading a list of five things. And number two, would I have really learned anything? Would I have really like, would it have shifted my mindset? Would it have given me any better insight into the customer that I didn't have? Like probably not. Yeah, I think something that, that, you know, just a discussion that comes up at Gorilla is sometimes it's like, it's hard to hand clients off in the content team. It can be hard sometimes. Um, someone builds up a lot of knowledge of, you know, this very complicated piece of machinery that we're selling or so, what have you. And it's like, and something that folks will say is like, well, we've got all these resources, we've got these call reports and we've got this stuff. And it's like, man, it, but we're competing against this f former person who did this, who spoke to people, like who was in the room. This is like a, this is like a breath. It's like LaCroix. This is like strawberries were in the other rooms. Like, yes, I, if I did the interview, like if I was on the call, if I was there and experienced the thing, all I have to do to be unmatchable by someone else with all these resources is just to really have been there and think about it and let it inform how I think about every further thing that I do. When I go into the next interview with a subject matter expert, like I need to be bringing a mindset to that. I don't need to be like, cause I'm not going to sit there with validate every takeaway that I've ever it's like, I need to have a living, breathing way that I'm understanding this subject, client, the market, my audience, whatever it is that I'm learning about. Um, it's just anyone can in 25 minutes get through these takeaways and you don't even need to go through them again. You were there, you experienced the event. So focus your time and thinking and attention on like a deeper understanding, like you ought to be able to, I refuse to believe it's so hard to understand your company's product that you need takeaways or your company's audience that you need takeaways to help guide you. You, you, you can do it. You just have to focus on understanding the damn thing um, instead of these weird frameworks and systems. And we just like dumb down our thinking for no reason, I think. Yeah, I love that, James. That's awesome. And what I was just thinking as you were explaining that piece of it, do you think that these takeaways like actually reaffirm like confirmation bias? Like when you see it in takeaway form and you're not given the time to really sit with it, absorb it, think about it and synthesize it, and you're just reading the synthesis, do you think it's natural for people to just pull out things that they already had a bias towards anyways? I mean, probably I like, I, I think that when you, when you engage in like that level of intellectual activity, which is checking in on the, just got to check a list of takeaways. Like that is when you are rife to, for biases and so on and so forth. I think that like, as someone who the, one of the biggest parts of my job now is just editing other people's work, like other folks content across like a wide variety of clients. It's like, I know that someone has an 
like a strong level of understanding and an audience knows that content is produced with a strong level of understanding. If you are engaging with like paradox, so like, do you understand, like there are contradictions everywhere in every field. There are contradictions, like every statement is wrong in some way. And, and you need to be able, you know, you understand something when you can talk about at length, th those contradictions, like, um, you know, how can something be the most, like the most affordable and the best for high volume production and not all like what makes it not good elsewhere? Like, show me the downside and there's no, how can there be no downside? And yet nobody does it this way. Oh, supply chain. Okay. That makes sense. But you don't get there unless you, you have to approach these things. You have to find the things that are paradoxes and find the things that are contradictions and find the things that are confusing. And those need to be the things that you focus your attention on because the thing that happens with takeaways is they're always going to be obvious. Like the things that are most interesting don't fit in a takeaway. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't get into a takeaway until someone has decided to synthesize it. Um, so like all that really interesting stuff that is really what you should be thinking about if you want to have a better understanding of your audience, your subject, whatever, than anyone else. Stuff that you have to be thinking about to be more intelligent than my team, basically, at doing this is that stuff. And you'll never think about it if all you engage in is synthesis of information into takeaways. You'll never be there. Love that. Nice one. Yeah. All um, right. I think that was good. Th those that was those awesome. were fun, I think. Um, hopefully, audience, you agree. Um, if you love takeaways and you have a problem, <laughs> with the episode, feel free to reach out to one of us, probably myself. I have a feeling Mary and Aaron will continue thinking about takeaways sometimes, um, maybe a little bit more than I, but, um, yeah, if you have a problem with anything we said, let us know. Um, if you like the episode, let us know if you want to be on the show as a part of season three, let us know. Um, we're taking guests still. Um, I think next week we, we've got someone great next week. Actually, I know who it is. I'm not even going to, yeah, don't gonna... spoil it. Um, it's a heavy hitter. Uh, but yeah, it's great talking. Mary, any last words? No, that was great. Um, as always, uh, reach out to us on LinkedIn if you want to be a guest, not email, because none of us checks that email. So Word. just a reminder. Thank you. Uh, peace, y'all. Take care.